In today's video, I'm going to tell you how to add depth to your watercolour paintings. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Michelle and on this channel we do all things watercolour, including mixed media, drawing, even a little bit of business and motivation for artists too. Please do consider subscribing, it's absolutely free. I make at least one free video a week here on YouTube with extra colour mixing content for channel members. Click the join button to find out more. One of the questions I'm most commonly asked on YouTube is how to get depth into paintings. You can consider the things that I'm telling you today to be a set of rules. Now rules are of course meant to be broken. There's no one thing that's going to add depth to your paintings. It's always a combination of lots of factors. We're going to look at these factors today. I've got eight of them for you to consider. But do remember that any one of these individually can be broken. I wouldn't advise breaking all of these. It's really a matter of how experienced you are and what the subject itself is telling you because there are certain things that you can do to add depth to a painting but if the scene you're looking at doesn't really contain those elements and you really just got started I would try and stick to these rules as closely as possible unless what you're seeing is obviously completely different. There's far too many of you trying to sort of play improvised jazz when you haven't even learnt your piano scales yet. And breaking rules requires not only knowledge but also instinct and you're only going to get that once you've done a lot of painting. So let's jump in and look at the first thing that's going to affect whether or not you have depth in your painting. This is something so many people get wrong and it's so easy to adjust. We're going to look at scale and size. So you are looking at a watercolour painting with charcoal that I did a few years ago. I want you to notice here how tiny the house in the distance is. It's really, really very small. I'm going to show you the photograph that I worked from and I believe it's a photograph I actually took myself. I seem to recall taking this one. Now, this building here, what happens is the human brain knows that houses are large and especially, you know, farm buildings like this are even larger than a standard house that you might live in, unless of course you are a farmer yourself. And so we know that this is a massive structure. And so what will happen is if I set somebody to draw this landscape exactly as it is, on paper that may be larger or smaller, but is of a similar proportion, in other words, the same width to height ratio, what will tend to happen is they will draw this building too big. Now they'll draw this building big because their brain is trying to tell them that this is a large object. And because they'll over-focus on it, it being the main thing of interest in this picture, now, not only will that tend to flatten the picture and it won't give a great sense of distance and depth. And here's somewhere where we can pretty much see the horizon. We can see a long way into the distance here. It's not covered up by any foreground objects. Not only will it flatten the picture, will it stop you getting a sense of depth, but it will also mean that you'll end up excluding some of the outside things. Because if you essentially zoom in, you know what happens if you zoom in on a camera, then you lose some of the outside. So by making this building bigger, you'll find that this area here, for instance, and these areas here are off of the picture. Again, you're losing that sense of this vast expanse of landscape and this tiny house in the distance. So what do you do to override your brain and stop it making things like this too large? You have to take some measurements. You don't have to measure specific metric or imperial measurements. You just have to get an idea of how big things are within the area that you're drawing. Let me show you how to do it. Now I've got a set square here, but you could use a ruler or even, you know, just a plain piece of paper. It's not the measurements that are important. We just want to look at the ratio. So one thing I can do is I can look at, you know, at the height overall and think to myself, where is this building in relation to the top and to the bottom? It's a little bit below halfway. I can also look in the other direction from here to here. I can see again, is it halfway? So halfway would be about here. It's just starting at the halfway point. So it goes to the right of halfway. So it's below halfway up and it's slightly to the right. So that's already put it into, you know, an area that's less than a quarter of the photograph as a whole. Then you just want to think about how much width it takes up and how much height it takes up. So, you know, if we were to actually measure it on this ruler here, it's about two and a half to three centimeters. Now, if you think about how many times that would fit into the picture this way, you know, we're talking about something that's probably maybe a tenth of the width of the picture. If we look at the height, it's even smaller. It's absolutely tiny. You know, think how many times that would go in to this ratio here. We're talking about perhaps one twentieth of the height 
of the picture, could be even less. And by taking these measurements and making yourself override your brain, which is trying to make you draw this bigger than it is, you'll get an accurate idea of where to place it on the picture. And then when you come to paint it, you won't do it too large. Another thing you want to look at is what I like to call repeating motifs. So a repeating motif is any object that is roughly the same size in reality, but that's going to get smaller in the distance because we know things get smaller in the distance, whether it's a fence post or some trees or some grasses. Grasses are a great one, actually. Let me show you another painting. So this one's too big to fit on camera, but I'll put a picture up of it so that you can see how the whole thing looks. And what I did with this one is I actually made a repeating motif work for me. So that would be the grasses and the reeds. So if we look at the bottom of the painting here, so if we look at how big these grasses are, so if I hold my fingers there and then I bring the painting down, and we look at the abbey here, the foreground grasses are almost as tall as the abbey itself. And if you're wondering, this is Whitby Abbey in North Yorkshire, one of my favorite places. And then look at these grasses here. Can you see how much difference there is between these tall ones here and these ones here, which are really much smaller? And then look at these tiny, tiny ones here. By the time I get up to the top here, I'm not really painting them much at all. I'm just hinting at them with little bits of paint bleeds. And this is helping to give depth to my picture. So beware of making buildings too large and larger than they actually are, of bringing them forwards. Make sure you make use of repeating motifs to ensure that things get smaller into the distance. Back to my original picture, look how small these bushes and trees are at the horizon line. Really very tiny indeed. Next, let's look at perspective. We're not going to go into huge depth of mathematical perspective, but I want you to look particularly at things like pathways and rivers that lead into the distance. Somebody was on my Facebook group this week and they said, oh, my pathways and my rivers are always pointing up into the sky. It's a really common problem. I'm gonna show you how to fix it and this will automatically give a sense of depth to your paintings. Here's a painting where I've only done really so far the sky and the, uh, the river here, I've just started the river. You can see how it just snakes away into the distance, but it's already looking quite flat. Now, often what happens if you get the perspective of things like this wrong is that they start to tip up towards you and this will really flatten your paintings. So let's think about that painting that I'm doing with the horizon line like this. My river sort of snakes off into the distance like this. And you can see that it's wider here where the river turns and that's giving this sense of flatness to the landscape. However, what a lot of people do is they draw a river or a path, something like this, and it starts to look like it's tipping up in the air. So there's two things wrong with this. One is that the angles here are just too steep, but the other is that it's meeting the horizon line, and we can see the horizon line in this picture, but it's meeting the horizon line, and yet we can still see some width. Now, the only time that this would actually happen is if something was rising up in front of you. So if, for instance, you were in some sand dunes like this, and there was a pathway here that was coming up and disappearing over the edge of that sand dune in front of you. So it's going up over the sand dune or the hill, and then it was coming down the other side. That is when you would see this width here. And because your brain knows that that's a thing, what it's doing is it's making this look like it's tipping uphill. And if it is actually tipping uphill, then this is correct. So our pathway climbing up over the sand dunes here is fine. But when it comes to something going off into the distance like this, we need to decrease the angles and we need to make sure that it actually disappears over the horizon line because perspective will meet at your eye line, which is generally speaking the horizon. There are one or two exceptions, but let's not worry about those in this video. They're very rare, mostly involved being up in aircraft. So what we need to do here is we need to decrease those angles and make sure that our river or path hits the horizon line. And this is going to flatten the perspective and give us more depth. It also works with things like paving slabs. If you draw a paving slab like this, a square paving slab, and it's exactly the same all around the sides, then it immediately looks like it's facing upwards, it's tipping up towards you. Now to make it lay flat, what we need to do is make it less deep and lessen the angles of the sides. Now you see it's starting to lay flatter. 
And if you don't understand perspective, at the end of the day, all you've got to do is accurately draw what you see and it will always be correct. At this point, can I jump in please and quickly ask you if you're enjoying this video, if you're getting some value from it, can I ask you please just to click that thumbs up, that like button, completely free to click the like button as it is to subscribe. You'll really help me to push this channel out to more people so I can teach more people how to paint and draw. I'm so grateful to all of you who watch me here on YouTube. Did you know that certain types of colour always look like they're coming towards you and other types of colour will tend to sink back into the background? Next, we're going to look at colour temperature. So let's talk about aerial perspective. Now, aerial perspective is nothing to do with the mathematical type of perspective, which is all about angles and vanishing points. Aerial perspective is the concept that things get bluer and softer and smaller as they go into the distance. And we can see it in this photograph here very clearly. Look at these distant mountains. If we walked up to them, we walked up close, they would be exactly the same color as these rocks and the mountains here. But because they're further away, they're looking blue. What causes this is mostly atmospherics, in other words, things in the air, dust, pollen, and pollutants. And all of those little things that are floating around in the air are all going to build up over great distance and cause us to see things as being softer and bluer. The cool thing about aerial perspective is you can use it in your paintings, not only of landscapes, but also of things that are up close, because the idea of things being bluer further away is completely embedded in our brains. And so we will see things even up close as being a little bit further away if they are a cooler color. So let's talk about color temperature and how you can use it in your paintings to show distance. So if we look at the idea of greens, for example, I'm just going to use my basic set here. It's got a little paint in because I've been mixing some stuff. But if we use some cooler colors, I'm just going to grab some cerulean I've got here as well. And we can make some cool soft greens. And then if we use some warmer colors, we can make some warm greens. So we can use this idea of our brain seeing warmer colors like this as closer to us and cooler, bluer, softer colors like this as further away to give depth to our paintings, not just to our landscapes, but also to things like still lives. So what do you do if the thing that you're looking at doesn't actually look like this? And I'm thinking perhaps of a sunset where you might have bright orange in the distance. Now, this is only a guideline. It's just one of the many things that we're learning about in this video that can add depth. It's not an exact rule. You might, for example, have some bright orange wheat fields in the distance. But even then, you want to see if you can perhaps consider using slightly paler colors farther away. So you can see in my painting here, there are yellow fields right the way away into the distance. But you do see how these ones I've done a little bit more orange. Then they go to a sort of a mid yellow. And right in the distance here, they're very, very pale and cool indeed. So having warmer colors at the front of your painting is not something that has to happen in every single painting. You may be able to use it in part of a painting. There will always be a situation where something doesn't quite follow those rules and you do have warmer colors at distance, but it's one of the many things that you can use in your paintings alongside all of the other things we're learning in this video to add depth, to add depth to your artwork because our brains will automatically see cooler, bluer colors as being further back. If you're not sure what constitutes warm and cool colors, I do have a video all about that and it goes through all of the colors in your palette explains what is meant by warm and cool and which ones are warm and cool. Don't worry if you don't know what it means because there are many, many people who don't. It's something I get asked all the time, so I made a whole video about it. I'll link to that video in the description of this one so you can watch it later on if you would like. It's so important when you want that sense of depth to actually lead the eye into a painting. It doesn't matter if it's a large landscape or even something like a still life. I'm going to show you how to use diagonals to draw the eye into the painting and avoid a few basic composition mistakes. So first of all, let's look at this painting where the diagonals are very, very obvious. So here we've got the sides of the river coming in and then we've got other diagonals coming in the other way and everything is working together to take your eye into the painting, but it doesn't have to be as obvious as this. Diagonals can actually be made up of single objects like trees because our brain will link things together. So let me show you another painting where the diagonals are still in play, but it's much less noticeable than this one. 
So here's my dip pen painting. This one's just ink with a little bit of colour and initially the composition looks very flat. It looks like everything just sort of comes along the front here. There's not really much in the way of diagonals taking the eye into the picture. But you see what I've done here with these cherry blossoms? And you see how these individual little clumps of cherry blossoms are all working diagonally. They come across here and then they hit the building and the eye goes up. Higher up, we also have more diagonals coming round here. And the eye may also jump around the picture, following these diagonals and joining things up. So diagonals can be strong, hard-edged things like roads and pathways and rivers. But they can also be individual objects. Those repeating motifs that we talked about before can be used by the artist to take the eye into the painting. I've even done it with still lifes with things like seashells in an arrangement on the table. And you can think about placing those seashells so that they take your eye in to the picture and those invisible diagonals join them up. Having a focal point is really important for getting a sense of depth in any painting. It's particularly important with larger subjects like landscapes, but beginners can find it so confusing they don't really understand how you make this mythical focal point. Let's tie it down. I've got some simple rules for you. I'm going to make it really easy for you to place a focal point in your picture. And as we go through this video, you'll also find more ways of accenting and bringing attention to that focal point. So let's talk about focal points and rules for focal points. Now, of course, there are all those mathematical formulas you can use, but really, honestly, most of the time I can't be bothered. So I just follow a few basic principles. Now, the focal point in this picture is obviously the lighthouse. Now, there are several things that tell us that this is the focal point. We'll talk about some more of those later. But where do you place your focal point? Well, you don't want it dead center. Again, rules are meant to be broken. I'm not saying that you'll never come across a subject where that works. But generally speaking, you want it not quite in the center. You don't want it too close to an edge. If you have a focal point, for instance, right over here, right next to what would be the frame of your painting, all that's going to happen is your eye might be taken to that focal point and then it'll go right off out of the picture. So the focal point wants to work within a picture so that the eye can move around, look at the outside objects and always come back to that focal point in the middle. It should also be the area of the greatest contrast between light and dark and the area of the sharpest focus. As long as you get those things right, everything should be fine. So we talked about colour temperature, but did you know you can also use splashes of bright colour and high colour contrast? in order to lead your eye into and accent your focal point. So let's continue with this painting for a moment and talk about using colour and contrast to highlight your focal point. So we've already seen we've got the greatest amount of light and dark contrast here in the lighthouse itself. But what about colour? Do you notice here that we have red on the lighthouse, but we also have some red here and some red here. And what's happening is these are joining up. So your eye is taken red, red, red. And you can use these hints of bright colour to lead your eye into a landscape. Let's look at some photographs of boats. Now this one here in the front here, this is quite a dull tonal photograph. It could be painted like this, but it would also be a fantastic opportunity to use some bright colours to take the eye into the picture. Most of these little boats are white or blue. This one here looks like it might be red. It's just not showing up on camera very much. And you also get a lot of these floats or boys that are mooring the boats forgive the non-boaty terms. So if you have a look at this painting here, what have we got? We've got all of these bright colours. We've got the red, the red, the orange, all taking our eye into and around the picture. If I was painting this first picture, I'd be very, very inclined to put some of those bright red and orange objects here and perhaps take the eye into the picture with some bright red or orange details on the boats. You might have noticed how photographers will blur the edge of things in order to keep your attention on a specific part of their photograph. And really that's how the human eye works. When we look at something, we see it very sharply. Other things just are a little bit more soft. Let me show you how to adjust sharpness and softness and use clarity to add depth to your watercolour paintings. Now, aerial perspective tells us that things are bluer and cooler in the distance, but they're also softer and paler. So in this pen and wash, I've used the ink to show the area where I want people to look. And I've used the lack of ink or the more simple use of ink to push other areas back. Do you see here how we have a lot of ink on this flower head? Everything's quite detailed. 
When we move out to the leaves, which are not the focus of this painting, I've simply outlined them. Now I think I could have done a lot more detail on those leaves. I could have done the centre stems, maybe some little vein lines radiating out, but I chose to leave them fairly basic and just outlined. And then look at the background. The background has no ink on at all. Another thing that you can do with ink pen that I haven't done here, but it's quite effective in landscapes, is where you want some of the ink to be further back, you use it lighter. You can also do it as a broken line, as opposed to using a more solid line in the foreground. Here you can see I've gone over some of the lines to make these lines stronger and more dominant. And this has helped to give depth to this painting, which is just one simple flower head. Here's a squirrel I painted years ago. Now you notice that there's a lot of detail on this squirrel, particularly around the eyes. He's very, very sharply focused. As I go to the rest of his body, and he's only viewed kind of waist up here, you can see that there's a lot less detail going on here. And then if we look at the background, there's no detail at all. It's all soft focus. That keeps the focus on the squirrel and allows the background to fade away, giving depth to our picture. Next, we're going to talk about detail versus simplicity. Now, obviously, the things that are closer to you, you'll see them in more detail. And the things that are further away, you may not notice them as much. They may be, as we've spoken about, in soft focus. And really, people can go wrong in different ways with this one. So some people paint in a very loose style and everything may end up loose without any kind of detail. Hard to see where you should be looking at. And then you get sort of more detail orientated people. And I would be one of those who tend to go over the top with detail and put detail in everywhere. Again, that's not going to give you any sense of depth in your painting because it's not naturally how we go through life and how we view the world. So let's look at some strategies for where you add detail and where you keep things more simple. So simplicity is something that's often used in views where you can see mountains like this and you can see that they've been done just as simple flat washes of colour. This idea of a flat wash of colour works really, really well. And you can even use it in paintings where you're painting things that are much closer to you. I actually have a technique I use now. I can't claim to have invented this because this was shown to me by the botanical artist who taught me, but I call it ghost leaves. Now, can you see here, you've got leaves at the front with quite a lot of detail and quite warm colors. Then as we go further back, the ones that I want to sink back and to give depth to this painting, these ones here, not only are they paler and bluer, taking advantage of that imprint in our brain of aerial perspective, even though we can't see it up close, our brains still automatically believe that these things are further back. But have a look at how I've actually painted these leaves. They're just flat washes. The only texture on them is a slight granulation to the paint. And it's really given this painting some depth and helped those leaves to sink back and go further behind. I also used it here in this painting of a toucan. Again, it's too big to fit on camera, but look at the leaves behind. They're just simple flat washes with a center stem. The toucan himself was so detailed, he didn't need anything else and I didn't want the leaves to compete with him. If everything comes forward, if everything is hugely detailed, you get an impression that everything is somewhat like wallpaper. By keeping some objects simple, you can add depth to your paintings. So do let me know in the comments what you found most useful in this video. If you have any strategies of your own to add depth to watercolour paintings. And I find myself lately more and more making content built around things that people have asked me. So do feel free as well to request other sorts of videos that you would like to see on this channel. And before you leave this video, don't forget to have a look in the video description. I've got all sorts of good stuff down there for you, including some free downloadable PDFs. If you download one of those, you'll get on my mailing list, or perhaps you're already on my mailing list. I actually, at the time of filming this, I have a landscape course coming out soon. And subscribers to my newsletter always get that introductory offer when I have a new course, as do members of my Facebook group. So make sure you stay in touch. At the beginning of this video, we talked a lot about drawing. Drawing can make such a difference to getting depth and a sense of realism and even atmosphere in your paintings. You can watch one of my drawing videos right now.